Hello. Before we begin, a quick note. The Boy to Sleep podcast relies on you and sponsors, which means you will hear a quick advertisement before the beginning of tonight's episode. While the podcast is free, you are welcome to subscribe for just $2.99 per month, which supports the creation of this podcast and gives you an ad-free listening experience. Simply click the link in the show notes from your podcast app. Rest easy. Hello. Welcome to the Bore You to Sleep podcast. The podcast that will hopefully help you get to sleep. I am going to read an open source book, one that is not particularly interesting, but one that is hopefully boring enough to get you to sleep. Tonight's reading comes from Philosophy by Bertrand Russell. My name is Teddy, and I aim to help people everywhere get a good night's rest. Sleep is so important, and my mission is to help you get the rest that you need. The podcast is designed to play in the background while you slowly fall asleep. Thank you to everyone who shared their words of gratitude with me during the week. Whether it be through the website or their podcast app, one of the most rewarding aspects of the podcast is hearing from all of the listeners who found the podcast beneficial. Firstly, a massive thank you to new subscribers and listeners of the Boy to Sleep podcast. Thank you to new patron on Patreon, Diane Brookvardney for supporting the podcast with a monthly contribution. Thank you to iTunes listener Linz000 for your lovely review and comments. Thank you to Podbean listener Mrs. D for sharing your kind words on Podbean. Thank you to all the Spotify listeners who took the time to leave a response in the episode Q&A. In the most recent episode, thank you to Joanna Holding, Julia Johan, Natalie, Eric, A Poison Potato 93, Lauren Adkins, Adrian, and Leon Wowsers. And I know I already mentioned it, but thank you again to all of the new subscribers on Spotify. While the subscription is done via Spotify, you're able to subscribe from any podcast app by clicking into the link in the show notes. My goal is to keep this podcast free to allow access for everyone, and it's the support from listeners via Patreon and Spotify that allows me to keep bringing out episodes for those who need them. If you do find the podcast beneficial, there are many ways you can help to support the creation of the podcast. For $2.99 per month, as mentioned before, you can become a subscriber and also ensure that you remove any Spotify ads at the beginning of the episode. If that is not possible, then an easy way to support the podcast is by subscribing and leaving a review and rating in your podcast app. If you would like, you can always say hello at boytosleep.com. In the meantime, lie back, relax, and enjoy the readings. Philosophy by Bertrand Russell Chapter 1 Philosophic Doubts Perhaps it might be expected that I should begin with a definition of philosophy, but rightly or wrongly, I do not propose to do so. The definition of philosophy will vary according to the philosophy we adopt. All that we can say to begin with is that there are certain problems which certain people find interesting 
and which do not, at least at present, belong to any of the special sciences. These problems are all such as to raise doubts concerning what commonly passes for knowledge, and if the doubts are to be answered, it can only be by means of a special study, to which we give the name philosophy. Therefore, the first step in defining philosophy is the indication of these problems and doubts, which is also the first step in the actual study of philosophy. There are some among the traditional problems of philosophy that do not seem to me to lend themselves to intellectual treatment because they transcend our cognitive powers. Such problems I shall not deal with. There are others, however, as to which, even if a final solution is not possible at present, yet much can be done to show the direction in which a solution is to be sought, and the kind of solution that may in time prove possible. Philosophy arises from an unusually obstinate attempt to arrive at real knowledge. What passes for knowledge in ordinary life suffers from three defects. It is cocksure, vague, and self-contradictory. The first step towards philosophy consists in becoming aware of these defects. Not in order, the rest content with a lazy scepticism, but in order to substitute an amended kind of knowledge, which shall be tentative, precise, and self-consistent. There is, of course, another quality which we wish our knowledge to possess, namely comprehensiveness. We wish the area of our knowledge to be as wide as possible, but this is the business of science rather than of philosophy. A man does not necessarily become a better philosopher through knowing more scientific facts. It is the principles and the methods and general conceptions that he should learn from the science if philosophy is what interests him. The philosopher's work is, so to speak, at the second remove from crude fact. Science tries to collect facts into bundles by means of scientific laws. These laws, rather than the original facts, are the raw material of philosophy. Philosophy involves a criticism of scientific knowledge, not from a point of view ultimately different from that of science, but from a point of view less concerned with details and more concerned with the harmony of the whole body of special sciences. The special sciences have all grown up by the use of notions derived from common sense, such as things and their qualities, space, time and causation. Science itself has shown that none of these common sense notions will quite serve for the explanation of the world but it is hardly the province of any special science to undertake the necessary reconstruction of fundamentals. This must be the business of philosophy. I want to say, to begin with, that I believe it is to be a business of very great importance. I believe that the philosophical errors in common sense beliefs not only produce confusion in science, but also do harm in ethics and politics, in social institutions, and in the conduct of everyday life. It will be no part of my business in this volume to point out these practical effects of bad philosophy. My business will be purely intellectual. But if I am right... The intellectual adventures which lie before us have effects in many directions which seem, 
at first sight, quite remote from our theme. The effect of our passions upon our beliefs forms a favourite subject of modern psychologists, but the converse effect, that of our beliefs upon our passions, also exists, though it is not such as an old-fashioned intellectualist psychology would have supposed. Although I shall not discuss it, we shall do well to bear it in mind, in order to realise that our discussions may have bearings upon matters lying outside the sphere of pure intellect. I mentioned a moment ago three defects in common beliefs, namely that they are cocksure, vague and self-contradictory. It is the business of philosophy to correct these defects so far as it can, without throwing over knowledge altogether. To be a good philosopher, a man must have a strong desire to know, combined with great caution in believing that he knows. He must also have logical acumen and the habit of exact thinking. All these, of course, are a matter of degree. Vagueness in particular belongs in some degree to all human thinking. We can diminish it indefinitely, but we can never abolish it wholly. Philosophy, accordingly, is a continuing activity, not something in which we can achieve final perfection once and for all. In this respect, philosophy has suffered from its association with theology. Theological dogmas are fixed and are regarded by the orthodox as incapable of improvement. Philosophers have too often tried to produce similarly final systems. They have not been content with the gradual approximations that satisfied men of science. In this they seem to me to have been mistaken. Philosophy should be piecemeal and provisional like science. Final truth belongs to heaven, not to this world. The three defects which I have mentioned are interconnected, and by becoming aware of any one we may be led to recognise the other two. I will illustrate all three by a few examples. Let us first take the belief in common objects such as tables and chairs and trees. We all feel quite sure about these in ordinary life, and yet our reasons for confidence are really very inadequate. Naive common sense supposes that they are what they appear to be, but that is impossible since they do not appear exactly alike to any two simultaneous observers. At least, it is not impossible if the object is a single thing, the same for all observers. If we are going to admit that the object is not what we see, we can no longer feel the same assurance that there is an object. This is the first intrusion of doubt. However, we shall speedily recover from this setback and say that of course the object is really what physics says it is. Now physics says that a table or a chair is really an incredibly vast system of electrons and protons in rapid motion with empty space in between. This is all very well. But the physicist, like the ordinary man, is dependent upon his senses for the existence of the physical world. If you go up to him solemnly and say, Would you be so kind as to tell me, as a physicist, what a chair really is? You will get a learned answer. But if you say without preamble, Is there a chair there? He will say, of course there is, 
can't you see it? To this you are to reply in the negative. You are to say, no, I see certain patches of colour, but I don't see any electrons or protons, and you tell me that they are what a chair consists of. He may reply, yes, but a large number of electrons and protons close together look like a patch of colour. What do you mean by look like, you will then ask. He is ready with an answer. He means that light waves start from the electrons and protons, or more probably are reflected by them from a source of light, reach the eye, have a series of effects upon the rods and cones, the optic nerve and the brain, and finally produce a sensation but he has never seen an eye or an optic nerve or a brain, any more than he has seen a chair. He has only seen patches of colour which he says are what eyes look like. That is to say, he thinks that the sensation you have when you, as you think, you see a chair, has a series of causes physical and psychological but all of them, on his own showing, lie essentially and forever outside experience. Nevertheless, he pretends to base his science upon observation. Obviously, there is here a problem for the logician, a problem belonging not to physics, but to quite another kind of study. This is a first example of the way in which the pursuit of precision destroys certainty. The physicist believes that he infers his electrons and protons from what he perceives, but the inference is never clearly set forth in a logical chain, and if it were, it might not look sufficiently plausible to warrant much confidence. In actual fact, the whole development from common sense objects to electrons and protons has been governed by certain beliefs, seldom conscious, but existing in every natural man. These beliefs are not unalterable, but they grow and develop like a tree. We start by thinking that a chair is as it appears to be, and is still there when we are not looking. But we find, by a little reflection, that these two beliefs are incompatible. If the chair is to persist independently of being seen by us, it must be something other than the patch of colour we see, because this is found to depend upon conditions extraneous to the chair such as how the light falls, whether we are wearing blue spectacles and so on. This forces the man of science to regard the real chair as the cause, or an indispensable part of the cause of our sensations when we see the chair. Thus we are committed to causation as a priory belief, without which we should have no reason for supposing that there is a real chair at all. Also, for the sake of permanence, we bring in the notion of substance. The real chair is a substance, or collection of substances possessed of permanence, and the power to cause sensations. This metaphysical belief has operated more or less unconsciously in the inference from sensations to electrons and protons. The philosopher must drag such beliefs into the light of day and see whether they still survive. Often, it will be found that they die on exposure Let us take up another point. The evidence for a physical law or for any scientific law 
always involves both memory and testimony. We have to rely both upon what we remember to have observed on former occasions and on what others say they have observed. In the very beginnings of science, it may have been possible sometimes to dispense with testimony, but very soon every scientific investigation began to be built upon previously ascertained results, and thus to depend upon what others had recorded. In fact, without the corroboration of testimony, we should hardly have had much confidence in the existence of physical objects. Sometimes people suffer from hallucinations. That is to say, they think they perceive physical objects but are not confirmed in this belief by the testimony of others. In such cases, we decide that they are mistaken It is the similarity between the perceptions of different people in similar situations that make us feel confident of the external causation of our perceptions. But for this, whatever naive beliefs we might have had in physical objects would have been dissipated long ago. Thus, memory and testimony are essential to science. Nevertheless, each of these is open to criticism by the sceptic. Even if we succeed, more or less, in meeting his criticism, we shall, if we are rational, be left with a less complete confidence in our original beliefs than we had before. Once more, we shall become less cocksure as we become more accurate. Both memory and testimony lead us into the sphere of psychology. I shall not at this stage discuss either beyond the point at which it is clear that there are genuine philosophical problems to be solved. I shall begin with memory. Memory is a word which has a variety of meanings, The kind that I am concerned with at the moment is the recollection of past occurrences. This is notoriously fallible, that every experimenter makes a record of the results of his experiment at the earliest possible moment. He considers the inference from written words to past events less likely to be mistaken than the direct beliefs which constitute memory. But sometime, though perhaps only for a few seconds, must elapse between the observation and the making of the record, unless the record is so fragmentary that memory is needed to interpret it. Thus we do not escape from the need of trusting memory to some degree, Moreover, without memory, we should not think of interpreting records as applying to the past, because we should not know that there was any past. Now apart from the arguments as to the proved fallibility of memory, there is one awkward consideration which the sceptic may urge. Remembering which occurs now cannot possibly, he may say, prove that what is remembered occurred at some other time, because the world might have sprung into five minutes ago, exactly as it then was, full of acts of remembering which were entirely misleading. Opponents of Darwin, such as Edmund Goss's father, urged a very similar argument against evolution. The world, they said, was created in 4004 BC, complete with fossils which were inserted to try our faith. The world was created suddenly, but it was made such as it would have been if it had evolved. There is no logical impossibility about this view, 
and similarly, there is no logical impossibility in the view that the world was created five minutes ago, complete with memories and records. This may seem an improbable hypothesis, but it is not logically refutable. Apart from this argument, which may be thought fantastic, there are reasons of detail for being more or less distrustful of memory. It is obvious that no direct confirmation of a belief about a past occurrence is possible, because we cannot make the past recur. We can find confirmation of an indirect kind in the revelations of others and in contemporary records. The latter, as we have seen, involve some degree of memory, but they may involve very little, for instance, when a shorthand report of a conversation or speech has been made at the time. But even then, we do not escape wholly from the need of memory extending over a longer stretch of time. Suppose a wholly imaginary conversation were produced for some criminal purpose. We should depend upon the memories of witnesses to establish its fictitious character in a law court. And all memory which extends over a long period of time is very apt to be mistaken. This is shown by the errors invariably found in autobiographies. Any man who comes across letters which he wrote many years ago can verify the manner in which his memory has falsified past events. For the reasons, the fact that we cannot free ourselves from dependence upon memory and building up knowledge is prima facie a reason for regarding what passes for knowledge is not quite certain. The whole of this subject of memory will be considered more carefully in later chapters. Testimony raises even more awkward problems. What makes them so awkward is the fact that testimony is involved in building up our knowledge of physics, and that, conversely, Physics is required in establishing the trustworthiness of testimony. Moreover, testimony raises all the problems connected with the relation of mind and matter. Some eminent philosophers, e.g. Leibniz, have constructed systems according to which there would be no such thing as testimony and yet have accepted as true many things, which cannot be known without it. I do not think philosophy has quite done justice to this problem, but a few words will, I think, show its gravity. For our purposes, we may define testimony as noises heard or shapes seen, analogous to those which we should make if we wished to convey an assertion, and believed by the hearer or seer to be due to someone else's desire to convey an assertion. Let us take a concrete instance. I ask a policeman the way, and he says, fourth turn to the right, third to the left. That is to say, I hear these sounds and perhaps I see what I interpret as his lips moving. I assume that he has a mind more or less like my own and has uttered these sounds with the same intention as I should have had if I had uttered them, namely to convey information in ordinary life. All this is not in any proper sense an inference. It is a belief which arises in us on the appropriate occasion. But if we are challenged, we have to substitute inference for spontaneous belief. And the more the inference is examined, 
the more shaky it looks. The inference that has to be made has two steps, one physical and one psychological. The physical inference is of the sort we considered a moment ago, in which we pass from a sensation to a physical occurrence. We hear noises and think they proceed from the policeman's body. We see moving shapes and interpret them as physical motions of his lips. This inference, as we saw earlier, is in part justified by testimony. Yet now we find that it has to be made before we can have reason to believe that there is any such thing as testimony. And this inference is certainly sometimes mistaken. Lunatics hear voices which other people do not hear. Instead of crediting them with abnormally acute hearing, we lock them up. But if we sometimes hear sentences which have not proceeded from a body, why should this not always be the case? Perhaps our imagination has conjured up all the things that we think others have said to us. But this is part of the general problem of inferring physical objects from sensations, which difficult as it is, is not the most difficult part of the logical puzzles concerning testimony. The most difficult part is the inference from the policeman's body to his mind. The inference to the policeman's mind certainly may be wrong. It is clear that a maker of waxworks could make a life like policeman and put a gramophone inside him which would cause him periodically to tell visitors the way to the most interesting part of the exhibition, at the entrance to which he would stand. They would have just the sort of evidence of his being alive that is found convincing in the case of other policemen. Descartes believed that animals have no minds, but are merely complicated automata, 18th century materialists extended this doctrine to men. But I am not now concerned with materialism. My problem is a different one. Even a materialist must admit that, when he talks, he means to convey something, that is to say, he uses words as signs, not as mere noises. It may be difficult to decide exactly what is meant by this statement, but it is clear that it means something and that it is true of one's own remarks. The question is, are we sure that it is true of the remarks we hear, as well as those we make, or are the remarks we hear perhaps just like other noises? merely meaningless disturbances of the air. The chief argument against this is analogy. The remarks we hear are like so much of those we make that we think they must have similar causes. But although we cannot dispense with analogy as a form of inference, it is by no means demonstrative and not infrequently leads us astray. We are therefore left once more with a prima facie reason for uncertainty and doubt. This question of what we mean ourselves when we speak brings me to another problem, that of introspection. Many philosophers have held that introspection gave the most indubitable of all knowledge. Others have held that there is no such thing as introspection. Descartes, after trying to doubt everything, arrived at, I think, therefore I am, as the basis for the rest of knowledge. Dr. John B. Watson, the behaviorist, holds, on the contrary, 
that what we did not think, but only talk, Dr. Watson, in real life, gives as much evidence of thinking as anyone does. So if he is not convinced that he thinks, we are all in a bad way. At any rate, the mere existence of such an opinion as his, on the part of a competent philosopher, must suffice to show that introspection is not so certain as some people have thought. The difference between introspection and what we call perception of external objects seems to me to be connected, not with what is primary in our knowledge, but with what is inferred. We think at one time that we are seeing a chair, at another that we are thinking about philosophy. The first we call perception of an external object, the second we call introspection. Now we have already found reason to doubt external perception, in the full-blooded sense in which common sense accepts it. I shall consider later that there is the indubitable and primitive in perception. For the moment, I shall anticipate by saying that what is indubitable in seeing a chair is the occurrence of a certain pattern of colours, but this occurrence we shall find is connected with me, just as much as with the chair. No one except myself can see exactly the pattern that I see. There is thus something subjective and private about what we take to be external perception, but this is concealed by precarious extensions into the physical world. I think introspection, on the contrary, involves precarious extensions into the mental world. Shorn of these, it is not very different from external perception shorn of its extensions. To make this clear, I shall try to show what we know to be occurring when, as we say, we think about philosophy. And that concludes tonight's readings. I hope you've enjoyed listening to this story, and if you're not quite tired yet, please feel free to listen to another episode of the Boy to Sleep podcast. Until next time, good night.